Our next question comes from Doc, incredible longtime subscriber, leaves a lot of great comments in the comment section. I appreciate you, Doc, incredible love, what you have to say on this channel. He says, get out there and train your shins against the ever-present threat of attack from coffee tables. He's making a joke because I mentioned something about banging my shins on coffee tables and how it doesn't really bother me since I've spent so many years kicking stuff. So, the... Nerve endings in my shins are a little bit dead, to be honest. The real question is, how conditioned are your big toes? Like, no, seriously. Though I know you're not intentionally kicking people with your big toes. Well, I know some people who do, actually. If you remember Jawad Mahmoudi, he's, he's been on my channel a couple of times. Did We did a, a very popular video on the ghost kick. Go check that one out. People seem to really like that one. Jawad is one of the most talented strikers I have ever met in my life. Extremely talented and a great coach and teacher of martial arts as well. Um, and he does some toe kicks that are just... It's, it's eerie how, how well he can do this stuff. Anyway, how conditioned are your big toes? Seriously, I know you're not intentionally kicking people with your big toes, unless you're Jawad or people like him, but how well conditioned are your feet and ankles? This is an, a very important question. I've got a relatively thick sole with enough meat on it that I don't have to worry there, but from the knee down, the front of my leg is all skin and bones. Yeah, that's how it is with most people. We have a very thin sheath of soft tissue around the front of the shin bone and skin over the top and a thick coat of fur over that if you're a hairy dude like me but that's beside the point the outsides of my knees seem like a magnet for being hit in the nerves and using my knees as weapons seems like it would hurt me more than them okay I've seen a lot of people run into this issue before. And if you are hurting yourself more than another person while throwing knees, it's, it's a technical issue. And it's a really easily fixable technical issue. When you throw a knee, instead of hitting with the patella, that's, that's the kneecap, you must bring your heel as close to your butt as you can so the patella tucks on the inside. And the bone that is exposed to the impact is, is not the patella, it's the femur. It's the end of the femur of your thigh. So if you point your toe to push that knee off, pull the heel as close to your butt as you can, then what's going to happen is then the patella goes inside. It is protected from damage. And the big, heavy end of the femur, one of the strongest structures on the human leg, is what takes and makes that impact. So... Hopefully I'll be able to put up an illustration of that on the screen so you can see what I'm talking about. But that's a technical issue, and you can fix that immediately. That's the good news, man. You don't have to spend a bunch of time conditioning your knees on a bag to make them effective striking tools like you do with your hands. See, this is a whole bunch of, you know, fragile small bones, and you got to spend quite a bit of time conditioning your fists if you want to make your bare fists a... A usable weapon in a fight without serious injury to you but your knee you can do that right away like instantly instantly just by fixing your technique and hallelujah because not every technique is like that most of them you have to grind at at least for a little bit now you'll have to grind at the skill acquisition to get the technique right but once you do boom your knees are going to be perfect so this is a long question, and it looks like a, a tiered question with a lot to them. How do I avoid Anderson Silva-ing myself? You know, when Anderson Silva snapped his shin, I, I think that's what Doc Incredible is talking about. I'm not super tall. I have a really slim skeleton, so even if I get out there and train as hard as I can, my ability to put on muscular padding is relatively limited. Well, it's... A lot of people are confused about why Anderson Silva and Chris Weidman and uh, Corey Hill and other MMA fighters have broken their shins and they're like, why don't we see this in Muay Thai? Well, it's because you don't watch Muay Thai. This has happened thousands of times in the sport of Muay Thai. It's, it's not a conditioning issue. It is a physics issue. When the weak part, the center of your shin, collides with 
one of the strongest parts of the shin, the top, just below the, the knee. With adequate force, what happens? It snaps. I mean, if, if I took this stick, right? It's like a long doweling rod. If I took this stick, and it's, it's a reasonably strong stick. I could swing this at a person. And if I did it the right way, I could, I could do some serious damage. But if I took this stick and swung it at, let's say, the, the angled edge of a heavy concrete object, and the middle of this long stick impacted that heavy angled concrete object, what happens? The stick is probably going to snap in two. That's a good fighting stick, too, but it would snap in two. And it's not a matter of conditioning. It's not a matter of, oh, I just picked the wrong stick. I didn't condition the stick enough. No, it's, it's a matter of physics. So anybody, anybody could experience what Anderson Silva experienced there. And those people who were saying Anderson Silva didn't condition his, his shins enough That is objectively stupid to say. I mean, we are talking about probably the best striker in the history of the mixed martial arts up till that point in history. I don't think anybody conditioned their shins more than him. Let's be honest. Very few fighters in the UFC had his level of, of Muay Thai expertise and training. I mean, it's just silly to say it was a conditioning issue. No, it's, it's a physics issue. So to avoid damaging your shins like Anderson Silva, what do you do? Well, avoid bad luck for one. Good luck with that. But two, set up your kicks the best you can so your opponent doesn't check them. Give him a problem up high before you throw a kick down low, basically. Because if the other guy's checking all your kicks, your setups are not good. So that's how we avoid Anderson Silva-ing ourselves. So what else do we have here? Again, this is a long question. I'm not John Dobson over here, says Doc Incredible. I don't even have the wrists to wear a watch. My boxing shell is less of a shell and more like a pair of sticks. Though there are ways to mitigate that with longer guards and such. Even my ability to put on fat is limited to my abdomen. In general, how do you go about training to get to the point where you can train? You know, it sounds like you're describing me as a kid, man. I have one photograph of myself at age 17. No, 16. Yeah, 16. Maybe I'll put it up on the screen right here. And I'm taking down the flag at my high school... That's, that's what I did. Took down the flag every day and folded it up and put it away. And you can't really see how skinny I am there because I'm wearing clothes, but you can probably see some of it in the arms. I was a pretty skinny dude. I weighed 90 pounds in this picture. 90 pounds. As in 10 less than 100 pounds. What is that in kilograms? Let me pull up my calculator here, do some metric conversions for everybody outside of the United States. 90 um, divided by 2 point, no, I pressed some extra buttons and got 8,700, oh, okay. 90 divided by 2.2, 40.9 kilograms is all I weighed. I was skinny. So Doc Incredible, I understand what being skinny is like, and I understand how it feels desperate and hopeless and like your options are very very limited i understand that a radical body transformation can be achieved but it doesn't happen quickly contrary to what the people who want to sell you something on the internet want to make you believe it doesn't happen quick so in general how do you go about training to get to the point where you can train I remember you've talked about exercising so you can exercise a bit more generally before. In a past video about working up to doing your first pull-up, and I think you also have a video about being too fat to exercise. I'm not that out of shape. 
I'm fit enough to lift weights, run on a treadmill, go to a boxing gym, take some classes without having to worry about gravity, but I don't have the I don't have the anaerobic conditioning to really get much out of it. I can work on my cardio as much as I want, and that's easy. Just get out there and go for a run. But is there any better way to condition my bony extremities for combat sports other than punching sand or kicking steel poles like Tony Ferguson until my bones have all fused into a single rock? Yes, don't do that. All due respect to Tony Ferguson. Those circus shows he was putting out on the internet are not, are not the best training methods that you should be following. Making your bones stronger is a very gradual process. Man, I, when you're talking about being too skinny to wear watches and your wrists are just like, man, I got the wrists of a baby. And, a, and what gives? That can change. Now, I don't have the biggest wrists in the world, but they're like twice the size of what they were when I was 16 in that picture. What do I weigh today? I weighed myself at 210 pounds the other day. 210 pounds. I'm trying to do metric conversion. Where's my calculator? Hold on. Pull this up for you. <laughs> ah. 210 divided by 2.2. 95.45. Four five, four five five kilograms. <laughs> if you want to be oddly specific. So what do you have to do to get to the point where you are getting something constructive out of your training as opposed to just, I don't know, being the skinny little wimp that gets ragdolled and brushed aside and can't even block a punch because because your your forearms are so skinny the fist fits right through it maybe covering up isn't going to be your thing good that's one of your last resorts in fighting anyway as far as boxing goes a long guard is an excellent guard i use long guards constantly why because you can parry with them you can block and parry and move and hand trap and do all this cool stuff that i like to do and the acquisition of those skills takes a long time. It takes some years, man. Just like putting on masks takes years. A lot of people think that bone conditioning, conditioning your shins for fighting, conditioning your striking points for fighting is a matter of just like punching a makiwara over and over again. And, and that won't make you worse by any stretch of the imagination and in many regards can help you and so on. But There's a very, very simple answer. I don't know why most people aren't saying this, but it's absolutely true. Lift weights. Lift some heavy weights. Pick up some heavy things and put them down again and repeat that consistently for years and years. Pay close attention to your diet. Eat. If you're a skinny twig, eat. Eat consistently. Eat more consistently. Put yourself on an eating schedule and make sure that you're getting the nutrients that grow bones. It's more important than building up muscles when you're a skinny little twig. Build up your bones, too. Because if you don't have the bone structure, you won't be able to support the muscle. It's called skeletal muscle for a reason, man. A lot of people look at others and say, oh man, he's genetically gifted. What do they generally mean by that? They generally don't know what they mean by that, but more often than not, what that means is the guy has a big, strong skeleton. A big, strong skeleton, which is a good frame to put the right types of athletic muscle on in the right quantities. So, yeah, man, lift heavy things, be consistent at it. Now, you mentioned cardio and running and doing cardio it's not a problem and that that's a different thing than the type of energy expenditure for fight training as you've noticed as you paid attention to that it's not anaerobic it's not running makes you better at running lifting makes you better at lifting fighting makes you better at fighting and there is some athletic crossover between those things but not direct crossover in most instances 
burpees, man. This is one of the stupidest exercises, which is incredibly, incredibly useful for building up sport-specific muscular endurance for combat sports. Why? Because you got a level change from the lowest to the highest. And really just that. And I could show you some other exercises where you go from the lowest point to the highest and have a big explosive burst like a jump or something in between, like a burpee does. But most people know what a burpee is, so if I throw that out at you, do some exercise, whatever it is. Do some shadow boxing, do some cardio, do something low impact, then do an interval of burpees, and then go back and do that lower impact thing for a little bit, then do another interval of burpees and do that on a timer, on a schedule. And it's going to change the way that your cardio sessions go. When you deliberately starve your muscles of both oxygen and glycogen, and then you ask them to do it anyway. And that little voice inside your head is like, No! Stop! Please! I can't! I can't take it anymore! Please! Sir! Stop! I don't know where that voice came from. It's, it's that annoying little voice inside of you that isn't yours. That's not my voice, man. Seriously, guys, that's not my real voice. That's not what I really sound like. Man, I get so many comments every day on YouTube saying, Why don't you use your real voice, Ramsey? Why, why do you talk like, like a man with a deep manly voice instead of a little girl? Why do you have that voice? I don't like that you have that voice because I don't have one and I want one too. <laughs> Buck up, campers. Maybe one day your voices will change too. But like all things in life, that, that takes time. Changes, substantial and important changes, take time. <laughs> this is not a popular message on the internet because you want something instant, right? Like that knee fix. If you just change the technique a little bit, boom, you're good. But you're asking some hard questions, and I'm giving you some hard answers, which is, this is going to take time. And I don't know how old you are. Um, you know, judging from your comments, uh, you, you seem like a pretty mature human being. I, I don't know if you're a kid or, or an adult um, who just, you know, due to random chance, luck of the draw, whatever it is, just didn't grow very big. But... Um, as long as you are alive, you can change your body to some extent. Not to great extents, but to some extent. As long as you're alive, you can get stronger, you can get flexible, you can get more technical. Now, I've rambled quite a bit, but part of your question, like, what was it exactly? How do you go about training to get to the point where you can train? This part is lingering with me, because... Most people reading your question would say it sounds like you're training, you know, you're going to classes, you're running, you, you know, you're, you're moving around, you're getting sweaty, you're giving it the old college try, that sounds like training, but I think you're asking me about combat sports specifically, how do I get to the point where it's, I can focus on improving in combat sports instead of just struggling like I'm breathing swamp water through my mouth. Just trying to catch up, because I'm not physically there yet, where I can focus on the technical improvements. It's a process, man. Carl Gotch, the famous catch wrestler, something he was notorious for, he would not take on a new student unless they could do... I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was hundreds of Hindu squats and hundreds of Hindu push-ups and a certain number of pull-ups and other physical feats. He would not take on a new student unless they were already athletic. Because essentially he didn't want to be their basic gym teacher telling them to do basic exercises. He wanted to teach athletes how to wrestle. And I understand that. I can appreciate that. Why? Because it's fun to train athletes. As a coach, that is... Ooh, that is the stuff. I love that. I love it when when a guy with a background in, say, rugby comes into my gym. And even if they know nothing about fighting, 
they're already a prime athlete. They know how to take a hit. They know how to, how to produce power. They know how, you know, they're fast, they're strong, they're durable. They put in all that legwork to the point where they can train, like our friend Doc in Incredible is saying. And so it get, it's really easy to train these guys, and it's really fun to train them, because then I can nerd out on technique and strategies instead of, you know, leading a, a glorified aerobics class, if you will. Your question reminded me of a point in my career. I was, how old was I? Like 23, something like that. 23, 24, I don't remember. And I was training with Shane Brenner. He's awesome dude. He's an awesome guy. He invited me to train with him privately. And man, the dude just... I owe that man a great debt of gratitude for what he was able to inspire me to do. He taught me how to learn, how to learn, how to learn. And I was I was kind of a wimp. Now, I knew a lot of stuff technically about kicking and punching and so on. But I didn't know a lot about athleticism. I didn't really understand or appreciate what it means to be an athlete. And I never considered myself to be an athlete. I don't know why... I thought it was okay to fight professionally and not consider myself an athlete. Like, ah, I'm never going to be an athlete. That's other people. If you were getting paid to compete in a sport, you're a professional athlete and you better act like it. You better act like it, man. If I could time travel and tell myself that, I would. So Shane taught me to be an athlete. Doc Incredible, become an athlete. This is imperative. The first book I ever picked up on karate, I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all because it told me the truth when I was a scrawny little 12-year-old getting beaten up by the bullies at school. I didn't like it because it told me the truth. And what was that truth? These are not magic tricks. Martial arts is hard. You've got to get out there and train hard. You've got to become an athlete. You must become physically strong. You must increase the strength of your muscles. You must make your bones stronger. You must make your tendons stronger. You must make your will harder and stronger. And I didn't like that because that wasn't me. And I didn't like the idea that I would have to push myself to become that. To push myself into a, not just a point of discomfort, but beyond that. Where that little voice inside of us, when we start doing a lot of burpees, starts saying stop. And we keep going and ten minutes later it is screaming, you will die. You will physically die if you keep doing this. Stop doing this. You're an idiot. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. But you just keep going anyway. Because why? You're an athlete. And that's what athletes do. Here's something else that athletes do. I've been trying to understand why I persist, why I have persisted at martial arts far beyond the getting bullied by bullies in school phase of life. And part of it is it's awesome and it's fun and, and I enjoy it. But why do I push myself to excellence as opposed to trying to be content with mediocrity saying, you know, I'm just a hobbyist. I'm not trying to win any trophies or anything like that. I'm trying to be the best I possibly can. As a martial artist, as a coach, as an athlete, as a mentor, etc., etc. And I push myself a lot. If 23, 24-year-old me, who was not an athlete was tasked to do the basics that I put myself through. Today, he would be frightened to death. He would want to run away. Because that little voice inside saying, No! That's the voice that had control back then. 
And until we're able to realize that's not us, that's not our voice, and take control of the reins, and tell ourselves, in spite of the difficulty, suck it up, buttercup, then we will not go about training to get to the point where we can train, where we can really train as a martial artist. And I'm not saying that every day is going to be easy, because every day should be challenging, appropriately challenging. It's the, the principle of progressive overload. And the problem with group martial arts classes is that everybody's at a different level, and when we throw the same objective and the same task and the same challenge at all these people on different levels, not everybody responds to it. Not everybody rises to the occasion the same way. Imagine for a minute if you had a group squatting class. And there are probably ways where you could structure a, a group squatting technique class in a very uh, constructive way, but imagine this fictional scenario where you have a group squatting class where everybody just shows up and they all do exactly what the instructor does and the instructor puts 100 kilos on the bar and starts squatting and says, you do the same. All right, if we have a random sampling of people there from all walks of life, a couple of them would be able to lift that pretty easy, a few of them would struggle, and a bunch of them would get killed and crushed under the weight of that bar. And group martial arts classes, more often than not, are structured exactly like that. All right, guys, take this weight, which for some of you is easy, some is challenging, and some will crush you to death, and everybody does, does the same thing. Everybody lifts the same weight. And the strong guys feel like, meh, this isn't really a challenge. And the intermediate athletes are like, mm, okay, yeah. I can dig this. Okay, yeah, here we go. And the novices and the beginners are thinking, there's something wrong with me. I can't do this. I'm getting crushed to death. I can't squat 100 kilograms. I'm dying here. I must be some sort of reject. Oh, man. I'm just not cut out for this. It must be genetic. No! It's because you haven't trained yourself to the point where you can squat that 100 kilograms. But that is how so many martial arts classes are structured these days. It's how most schools of any subject are structured these days. Throw everything at everyone the exact same way in the exact same quantity with the exact same expectation and then dish out a grade. All right, you guy who came out already as... You came in this class as an elite lifter, you get an A. Intermediate lifter, you get a B. And uh, novices who don't even know how to lift, who haven't put in the legwork, who don't understand the technique, who are not physically strong enough to move this, F. Doesn't matter that I didn't teach you how to move the bar, that I didn't teach you proper technique first, that we didn't warm up first or any of that. Pff, your fault, not mine. No. So, Doc Incredible, you, like many of us, have fallen prey to this unintentionally poorly designed structure of pedagogy that is the martial arts industry. And Maybe some private classes could help. Maybe I say that with a big if, because not every coach understands how to optimize a private training class, but um, consider it. How do you get to the point where you can train? where you are getting out of your training what you want to get out of it, what you need to get out of it. Baby steps. Baby steps. The smallest 
acceptable, tolerable increment is what you need. And maybe that's going to be just throw a couple of burpees in your interval. But do something that triggers that little voice inside your head that screams at you to stop and tells you you're weak and tells you you're not strong enough and not good enough and never will be. Do something. Add something to your routine that triggers that so that you can gain the experience of fighting that voice. Because every fight has two opponents. The guy in front of you and the guy right there. And if you're fighting two guys, two on one, that's a losing fight. Beat this guy first by building him up. Thank you for watching. Now get out there and train.